to welcome Sue Rilston from Bio, who's looking at um, examples and case studies and some lovely stories about how, how can we live well within natural limits. So, Sue. Well, a lot on the work of Tyndall Centre in trying to model how can we live well within natural limits, as well as working for 20 years on sustainable living. It's our 20th anniversary this year. Um, so you, what I love to be able to say is it can be done. Basically what we're trying to do is we're working on sustainable living, we're consuming too much, how can we live well within natural limits? That's what we do at Bioregional through places that we live but also products and services. Um, and we call this, this living well within the natural limits of the planet and leaving space for wildlife and wilderness. Yeah, we call this one planet living. We're a charity. Um, but we win awards for being a social enterprise and we sort of evolved so people that worked at Bioregional then go off to Ottawa or then to South Africa and they go back to Durban and we set up a little Bioregional being there. Uh, but in the UK we've got an office, our main office is in London at Nico Community, a bit like this. And uh, we're also working in Oxford at the Eco Town and in Brighton, where we also have worked on an eco community, and in New York, where we've got a person working on policy at the UN. We've talked about carbon footprint, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about ecological footprint. Have, has anyone heard of ecological footprint? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it's a way of looking at everything we consume in relation to uh, the amount of resources that are available on our one planet. So that's the built up land, the forest land, the crop land, and um, the sort of areas of productive ocean for fishing, uh, grazing land, and also carbon. So um, they give that a figure so that that can be included in, because if you only counted carbon and didn't count you know, land to grow crops and so on, um, then you might, that might give you the idea that biofuels to replace the huge amounts of energy that we're wasting from fossil fuels would be okay, whereas in fact, of course, it wouldn't. Um, so here you can see how much carbon is of our ecological footprint, and that's humanity, what we consume, and uh, it's about half. So we do need to do something about carbon. Um, and our consumption has grown, um, it's probably about the mid 1980s, we started to consume more resources every year or create more pollution than the planet could absorb or the planet could produce annually. So it's not a perfect science, it doesn't include everything, but it gives you the big picture, and that's why we like it. It's a good way of communicating um, the scale of the challenge and what we need to do. People in different countries are consuming at different rates. So um, here you can see the good old US of A. I do know some really nice Americans. Um, <laughs> But they are consuming a lot. Uh, and this would be the sort of sustainable level. And you can see that purple carbon in there. Um, and as you sort of go down, that's the sort of world average. This, this um, so you can see we're having sort of, if everyone lived like the average American, we'd need five planets. If everyone needed, lived like the average UK citizen, we'd need about three planets, the average European. Countries like Haiti or um, Swaziland, you know, they don't have enough. And so, you know, they need to come up and we need to become more resource sufficient. So a lot of people talk about that in carbon circles as contraction and convergence. And that's what we, that's what we need. Um, and if you then think about it from the point of view of um, the human development, we can take the United Nations Human Development Conference, <coughs> which is all those good things that Maria was talking about, like literacy, um, do children get to go to school, health, uh, and so we want a, a low ecological footprint and a high human development index. You can see that we're sort of aiming for this corner down here and nobody's in it. Um, the, year, the year I was born, or rather the year I was born, 1961, I was born in 60, but that's close enough, uh, there were only three million people on the planet, and now there are seven, and so there's kind of a, you know, how much is there to go around issue because now, with, that was actually a 2006 <coughs> fit, less to go around, so it's actually going to be in that corner. And the country that actually comes closest is Cuba uh, at that time, because they'd had a blockade on oil, so they were, they were going for organic agriculture and saving energy. Um, as, and they also had quite a lot of social, good social policies. So
uh, it's interesting, come of Latin American countries come close. So what we need, we all need one planet living, this lovely world that I feel choked to think about, um, where we can live happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of our planet and within a fair share of the world's resources and leave some space for wildlife and wilderness. You would have all heard the Living Planet report, um, biodiversity's halved in 40 years. You know, this is terrible, terrible. And we're all fighting battles in our own communities, or in my community, the local authority wants to build a school on a nature conservation site, or we could breed bell site. And if they do that, where are the long adults that nest over the back going to go? Well, as I said earlier, the good news that I love to share is um, that I, I think good living for 7 billion people within these limits, it really is possible. And I, I feel it because I've, we've been working on trying to introduce products and places where you can live within the limits. Um, so here's sort of three examples which are like the sort of jigsaw puzzle pieces of our potential sustainable future. I'm mainly going to talk about communities, so I won't dwell on BEDZ, um, but that's where I live, um, and if people who live there can massively reduce their personal CO2. We have here a local charcoal product, so that was something that we worked on 17, 18 years ago, um, bringing local coppice woodlands into management and producing a local charcoal product into national retailers as an alternative to imported charcoal and all that transport that might be coming from um, endangered forests and probably using indentured labour as well. So a really good product if you manage the woodlands sustainably, you get more wildlife, butterflies and so on, um, and more amenity, people can go walking in the woodland and you create jobs and you get a very good quality product get an 85% cut in transport CO2 of that product from where it was produced to the store. So we had this network all across the UK. <coughs> Recycled paper loop. So we promoted recycle your paper to the recycling mill just around London and then buy back the paper produced and also print on both sides, don't print so much. Um, we had a sort of a marketing thing, um, promoting is promoting collectors and promoting buying back the paper. And when we had an LCA of this done by Surrey University, um, it showed a 93% reduction in the ecological footprint of your paper use. So you know that it's, we all know it's good to recycle, we all know it's good to buy local products, but it's really good to get some evidence uh, and, say, and just show, oh, you know, and look at the results. So we all know it's good, so we should just all do it, basically. It's a project that we did at Bioregional because we needed a new office. Um, I'm not an architect, <laughs> I'm just an environmentalist. I actually used to be a nurse. Um, but wanted to do something. I just wanted to do something. And so together with my now husband, we set up Bioregional and we were working on these products. And then we grew a bit and we needed a new office. And we thought, well, let's have an eco office. And so we went around the local area looking for sites and we found this place. I thought, oh, it's really big. We could, it was actually a, a bit of brown, a brownfield site, which had been called the Sewer Spring Works. So um, we thought, oh, fantastic, we can live there as well. So we took the project around and we, people in trust, put up the money. We kind of designed it up a bit so there was a picture with a price tag. Um, and people in trust put up the money to do it. Uh, it's 100 homes, uh, workspace. Uh, there's a college for people with learning disabilities. The architects who worked on the project have an office there as well. Um, if you take that ecological, that three planet UK ecological footprint that I mentioned earlier, and then actually break that down, you can start to see what are the areas that we need to tackle. And the main difference is food. So food would be a lot smaller if you were just thinking about carbon um, than when you consider eco footprint. So housing. Building our homes, maintaining them, is about 8% of our footprint. Um, home energy use is about 18% of our footprint. Uh, transport, 15%. And if you took them as carbon, that would be 23% and 23% for the figures at the time. 23% um, food, so it's very important to do something about food. And eating a lot of meat and dairy has a very high impact and also food waste. <laughs> a big issue. We waste about a third of the food that we produce, not just in the UK but all around the world for different reasons. Um, 
consumer goods, all that stuff we buy. Um, and then this is the sort of government and business, the sort of capital assets that we all use. So these here, we can all do something about, but we probably need someone else to help us with it or make that available. This bit here is government and business. So that's, everyone there gets that locked on their footprint. So we can do something about this, we can't necessarily tackle that. So at Bedford, uh, we tried to design in sustainability at the start. So we had, it's called Bedford because that stands for Beddington, which is the local area, and Z, which is zero energy development, and it said fossil in brackets, because it otherwise. And we also, it's very funny, because if you've ever heard of Z beds, those bumped up things. And we have Z cars, but I can't park as well. So. And so we had this strategy to reduce down the energy demand of the building. So we've got walls that thick with lots of insulation. So it's actually to a passive house standard, which I think the Lancaster, Lancaster co-housing also is. Bigger windows on the south, smaller windows on the north. Uh, very well insulated so that we don't actually need central heating, which at the time would have added about three and a half thousand pounds to the build cost. So that's a saving, not having to have central heating, although well, I do have a little radiator just for those when it's snowing. We, then we had um, renewable energy, so you can see we've got uh, photovoltaics uh, in the same place of windows and roofs, uh, and that produces about 20% of our electricity. We also have a district heating system with hot water, very, very hot water going around the site, and that heats up clean water in the water tank. And when we first set up, we had a biomass combined heat and power <coughs> plant, which gasified the wood and the gas produced was used to run a green engine, which uh, generated electricity, and we used the waste heat from that to heat the hot water. But after some years of engineers in boiler suits walking in and out, in the end, it was decided it's too small to run on a a site for just you know, 100 homes, it's too small for the amount of maintenance it needed. So we've actually been running on the gas backup for quite a few years now, which is disappointing to all of us. Um, and we'd be very happy to put in a wood heat system. Um, but I think Bedzeg was very pioneering in its day. This was back in 97 that we thought about it. 2000 we got on the site. 2002 people moved in. So we've been on site for 12 years now. So I guess it's sort of Ten years ahead of um, this. We, it's important to think about the construction materials. Construction materials are about, I think, 70% of the impact of uh, buildings, and some of them are a lot worse than others. So we try to choose the sort of simple rule of thumb is try and choose traditional local building materials because they're probably the lower impact ones. And indeed, we had local brick um, from the local brickworks and green oak weather building. But we had to get our windows from Scandinavia because um, they were well insulated and good. Um, but these days you can get better windows uh, more locally. We, you use as much energy driving around in your car as you would in your home on average in the UK. So we had a green transport plan. And that included um, having love what was then only the second car club in the country, I think. Um, so the car club means that you have a, have a little card uh, and I could, I could put an app on my iPad and I could just book up the car when I need to. Well, obviously the location we are in in London is very easy uh, because you've got public transport, you've got the main trains very nearby, buses. So it makes it easy, but even so you still do need a car if you've got something heavy to pick up. So car clubs are a brilliant solution. Uh, we also did things like, if you have a bike and you love your bike and you come outside and someone's nicked the saddle, it's very disappointing. So um, we did put some parking outside, but we also made sure that every house had bicycle parking right by the front door. That's one of the sort of main things that I want you to take away and remember that we found is you've got to make it easy to do the right sustainable thing and difficult to do the wrong thing. And I think the trouble with our lives today is they're all designed Perhaps by accident, you know, you know, it's so easy to get an easy jet ticket and fly everywhere and cheap. It's easy for me to get my bike by the front door. If I need a car, the car club car's over there. We push the parking to the edge of the development so it's not just your cars outside the front door because it's just too easy to get in and drive down the road by a pint of milk. Oh, so I should say what we've saved, shouldn't I? 
So with the energy, um, I think it's a 71, 73% reduction in the carbon of the, in the bill. I think the average bill is about 1,500 to £2,000 a year, and mine is, I think I pay £25 a month for my electricity, heating and water. I mean, it's really, really with the Green Transport Plan, when we've done the monitoring, we've got a 50% reduction in our car use. When I'm trying to convince developers that they should do this, I always say, well, you don't need, you know, in an eco community, you don't need so many, so much land, valuable land, taking up with roads and car parking spaces. So, you know, you can have narrow, narrow roads and you can actually build on that space and sell it, which is a real commercial advantage. We've got about 50% reduction in car use, 50 to 60% depending on um, how you measure it. And I think we have 0.6 parking spaces per unit. Uh, water, we save about half. So I use about 70, in our house, we use about 70 litres per person per day, which is half, 140 litres was the average for a uh, Composting and recycling, what we found is, um, it's just not easy enough. So we've got divided bins under the sea. I often go down to the bin areas and go, oh no, look, someone's put recyclables in the bin. So when we monitored, we got a 65% recycling rate, which is what you'd really hope for. Um, but I know it's not that good, generally speaking. Giving back to the energy, I should say, we put the meters on the show. These days you can do amazing things with gadgets. But at the time, it was basically meters in the cupboard under the stairs you don't really know how much energy you're using so we put the meter on the wall by the kitchen sink so that people can with a little glass you can look through and see what you're using so if i put the kettle on or if the oven goes on i notice those are the things which really do use the most energy you can see the meter whizzing around um, and the same with the water the water meter's there so when the washing machine goes on or you're just much more aware of the resources that you're using we did a lot of work, we fitted out all the apartments and homes with um, low energy appliances and we thought we'd get 25% reduction in the electricity use, but actually we got 45% and we decided that that must be because um, people are um, changing their behaviour basically. Food is a big part of the impact. We have actually set up a community farm locally since we did Bed said. Um, and just encouraging people to compost, have allotments, um, think about food, don't waste it. Culture and heritage was also important to us. We um, planted up lavender plants because that's a local crop and that's another thing that we've worked on locally. Um, those traditional building materials, and we can learn a lot from cultural heritage. You know, what did our ancestors do when they didn't have fossil fuels to burn? This is Nicole. She's worked at Vine for about, well, she came to work on Bedford, she's a civil engineer um, and a dedicated person. And she managed to get her eco footprint down to 1.7 planets and her carbon footprint to six tons a year. Uh, so that's obviously still too high. Now, for one planet living, we need about 1.5 tons of carbon per person per year, I believe. Um, that's all around the world. With 79 billion people. Um, so obviously that's not quite good enough, but part of the reason for that is this, and she, she doesn't eat meat, she belongs to the car club, but she does use the car sometimes, but she wasn't flying anywhere that year. Um, and this it just goes back to that point of when you get almost a whole planet lumped on, and a lot of carbon emissions lumped onto your own footprint. So you could achieve one planet living in isolation, but we are all part <coughs> of a bigger society. We all have to have that added onto our footprint. So. so it just shows there's no room for little demonstration projects. We've got to basically do this every day. When we surveyed residents, you know, we measured everything. We also asked them what do they like? Um, about beds, so, you know, what do they like about living there? And the thing that people liked the most was the quality of life and the community spirit. And people at Bedsit know on average 20 of their neighbours, whereas over the road, by the busy main road, they only know eight. Uh, and knowing all of your neighbours is a sort of NHS thing, measure. Um, if you know more neighbours, you will have better mental and physical health because we all need that. We're social beings, you know, we need that contact. And in many ways the car has, you know, 
driven us apart, being in a car, giving over so much space to the car, if we were walking about uh, and meeting each other, we, we feel better as well as we have better um, health. So we built on that, the strategies that we had for bedsetting and, and developed that into, um, basically we formalised it, we, what's the word, we standardised it as a framework which anyone can use, so you can use it if you want to. Um, and we've got these 10 principles, zero carbon in the building energy use, I'm going to go into the detailed one, zero carbon in the building energy use, uh, zero waste, so we don't want to waste, there is no such thing as waste, these are just resources that we can reuse, we should keep the value of that in, in the system. Um, sustainable transport, sustainable materials, <coughs> local sustainable food, sustainable water, land use and wildlife, at better we had um, green roofs and we tried to sort of bring more wildlife onto the site even when we were building on there. Reviving local identity and wisdom, um, equity in the local economy, creating jobs and supporting local op op communities and fair trade, uh, and health and happiness, so promoting health and, and well-being. How we use One Planet Living as a process is Basically, you just need to gather a bit of information about whatever it is you're trying to achieve on planet living in, um, whether it's a community or a company. Um, and, you know, where are all of our impacts? Well, how much energy are we using? Mm. How many miles are we driving? And we have actually got a calculator on our website, so if you want to, it's got slightly old data on it, but it will give you the broad picture if you want to go on. But you need your bills to do the detailed one to get a better result. And then the way that we tend to use it is it's best if those people concerned who need to do something about this and want to try and enable and achieve one kind of living work together in workshops to create an action plan so, and then make that action plan available for others to see, to share it and then get on with implementing it and then tell everyone how you got on every year. So we've been working with partners around the world, um, quite a lot of things in the UK and around the world and a lot of these projects they do publish their um, their action plan and share ideas and we're just working to just make that even more open source and available so people can just do their plan put it on a map and you can sort of search by what does someone do for zero carbon because i we made it available as a sort of pdf toolkit and then i would get people meet people like this guy who said to me Oh, we downloaded your toolkit and um, we did a one point action plan for our sixth form college in Lucerne. And I'll never have known that. So we're trying to sort of capture that information and, and then maybe if someone, they could upload in their plan and then someone who wants to also do a sixth form college could say, oh, that's what they did in that sixth form college. We can share ideas. So we're just working on making that more available. After we did BEDSED, our local authority sat up and took a bit more notice because we still we get visitors come all over the world. We have Chinese Minister of Construction, we do tour, you do tours here, I know. We get we run guided tours, it's one of these wards. Our local authority got really interested and said we'd like to do one planet living. So uh, we started work on that. It's just a typical London suburb. You can see there with lots of cars. Lots of people work in London. Um, so there we are. This is actually an act, a local action plan for the Hackbridge area, where where Bed Z is. Um, it's, it's, it's called Beddington, it's also called Hackbridge. Um, so there we are in the church hall, working through those ten principles and thinking, what do we all want for our community, uh, and then implementing it. So we did. A, we've done. We started off back in 2007, 8 with lots of work on energy efficiency. More recently, we. So this is the guy who runs the coffee van at the station and we had a bit of fun with the solar panels on his coffee van. Um, and it had all these extra advantages. He found he could actually go off grid a bit more and <coughs> serve coffee in places where we couldn't plug in. Uh, and there's not, you've not got the fumes of having the engine running. Um, and I was checking the figures because I was talking to Phil about it, who's a real energy <coughs> saving expert. Um, and in Sutton, over five years, we've reduced carbon emissions by 19%, which is quite good. Obviously it's not the 10% a year, but that's a sort of cumulative after effect, isn't it? And we've got our farm. Uh, I'm not, I'm going to run out of time because I've got so much detail there and I want to quickly get to capital consumption. But just to say, this project in Brighton, uh, that did all the One Planet Living things. It's got 
community, Lou Gray. It's a, it's a block of apartments by a station. Um, it's, got its, it's got its problems in that there's a very transient student population. It's very hard to get there, especially if they're from China or somewhere. And they just like, what are you talking about? Um, you know, to actually get their attention and get them to participate in things. But that was built within the normal range of building costs. And it's sold a lot faster because when you go there, it just feels nice. Like when you come here, it just feels nice. And people want to buy into that. So I think we're all on to something here. When Gordon Brown said we want to make eco towers, I wrote him a letter and said, do you want a hand? And <laughs> then got involved in this group with the TCPA and then eventually uh, was invited to join the eco towers challenge panel. And we wrote, a, you know, what makes an eco town as well, which you can get from our website. And this then led to a planning policy statement, which the current government <coughs> is trying to abolish, but it's still hanging in there just about at the moment. Um, and some of the interesting things about that, as it will be 5,000 new build on the edge of the market town, is looking at this sort of energy storage, energy balancing, this how not to waste it, how to have decentralised energy systems, is what we're right up against now, really, really trying to make that work in the mainstream development. But it's all possible. And this is what I wanted to make sure I told you about. So <coughs> we actually took the Tyndall Centre bathtub approach of there's only this many more emissions we can emit before we hit two degrees. Um, but we did this in 2009, and we would have had data from a bit earlier. So it was only 6% for year, year on year then. <coughs> um, but we did model it for London. How could we um, live well within limits? We had 64 measures and one overarching measure. We found that um, we needed um, totally renewable, 95% decarbonised electricity grid by 2030, otherwise we couldn't actually achieve it. Uh, and this is consumption-based emissions, so this includes the goods we buy, the clothes, the, the construction, you know, wherever, as well as the plug-in fuel and all that. Um, so there were eight areas, um, and just to give you a highlight of some of the 64 measures, it was actually included flying half as often in 30% more efficient planes because that was felt to be possible um, by the industry. You know, we, we took things that could be done. Uh, with food, it was eating, I think it was half as much meat and a third as much dairy, um, doing things with um, having zero carbon farms uh, in terms of their energy use, um, improvements in food supply systems, and all of these things were felt to be possible by the Food Climate Research Network. So you can download this report from our website, but basically, I know that doesn't look like it, that does actually work because that bit goes up there. Um, so it did actually, it can be done. And uh, this led to um, an actual standard for cities called PAS 2017, and a case study for London was just recently published. It was just the sort of things that we would all expect, you know, travelling a bit less, working from home a bit more, using public transport, um, saving energy in the home renewable energy supply. It's not buying half as many clothes, just make them last a bit longer, maybe pay a bit more for them. It was all perfectly possible. We worked on the Olympics using this approach, and we've worked with, particularly with B&Q, a big company. Um, Ian Cheshire is brilliant, he's just leaving Kingfisher, but he's really been a CEO who's spearheaded this thing. We need products that will help us reduce our footprint, and what we found when we did the study was there's a potential for a 10% reduction in the eco footprint, you know, B&Q, with the things they sell in their store, can help customers to reduce their eco footprint by 10% with some of these sort of products. And when we talked about Grow Your Own, they're like, oh, that's interesting. And then it was, it flew off the shelves, all the seeds, you know, they really gave a big promotion to growing your own food, and it was a big bestseller for them. They've also committed it on it as a company. So when we started working with them in 2007, we said you've got to reduce by 20% by as soon as possible because you're supposed to be the leader. So they're to achieve it by 2023. And we all agree, we don't know how we're going to do it, we just know it's what needs to be done, it's what the science tells us is necessary. But they've achieved 30% so far, which is pretty good. Um, and now they're getting into, are we going to basically buy energy? Are we going to own and run energy, some sort of renewable energy? Because they've, they've done a lot with the lighting, the windows in stores. Um, the main way they've achieved it is just complete. They went from half, about 16% recycling and reuse to 90%.
that's just to show that around the world these sort of ideas can work anywhere. <coughs> so this is um, Mazda City in Los Alamos. We gave them a bit of advice, but one of the things that they did was they looked at the traditional way of doing things, how they kept in school. It's so hot there, everyone gets from an air-conditioned car straight into an air-conditioned building. Um, so one thing they did was um, have sort of more vertical, tall vertical um, places for people to be, which you know just cut down the sun and orient it in the right way, which is what they always used to do, and have these sort of tunnels to send the heat up. Um, and it's, it's reduced by seven degrees the temperature so that people can actually go outside and sit by that water and actually, I think that's actually a computer generated thing, but that is actually happening. But in Tanzania, um, we're working on a project there with a nature reserve where the uh, wildebeest go by the Serengeti and they're doing a brilliant job um, actually repopulating uh, that. But um, their uh, One Planet plan includes um, energy efficient light bulbs and trialling solar lanterns and things like that. So these, this approach to sustainable living basically works anywhere. We did some work in the favela for Rio plus 20 billion tonnes. Um, and uh, I think people do want to have a better life and they do want to do something but they just don't know how. So, um, you know, we can all do something in our community. As I say, I, I'm just an ordinary, you know, I just was someone who, when I was 30 who thought, oh my god, this is terrible, I've got to do something. I can't go back to being a nurse. I want to try and do something about this and have a creative place to live and, you know, create a job, actually. Um, so, you know, I think we can all do this with what's happened here at Lancaster Co Housing. I think we can all <coughs> not just have to go, oh my god, look at the state of the world. I think we can all do something in our own communities. And as I mentioned, we're currently working on these sustainable development goals and watch out for them because they're for everyone, wherever you live in the world, the same goals for sustainable living or sustainable development. Um, and we're working very hard. We went to every Rio Plus 20 preparatory meeting and helped we had the first workshops championing for the government championing these sustainable development goals. And you know, we're really we we put we've put a lot of hope on that 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 could be something really good, a bit like local agenda 21, but all around the world this e equity that we all have the same goal. So just to finish off by saying, you know, living well within limits.